and everyone will hear that when they join us. Um, and I'm going to hit the start webinar button, Paula, and the people start trickling in and we'll give them sure. a few minutes to do so. I'm going to go off camera and on mute. I'm the background. This is all about you guys. So have fun and uh, looking forward to this. Okay, everyone, we see uh, a number of you logging on. So we'll start in a few minutes. So if you just be patient with us, we're going to wait till we get everyone logged on here. So looking forward to starting it too. Hi everyone, for those of you just joining, we are still waiting for a number of people to log on. We are starting to see them logging on now, so bear with us. Just give us a couple more minutes and we'll be good to go. Good to see more and more people starting to join us. We're getting there. I think we'll need another minute or so. Very excited to see a whole bunch of names here that we know. So welcome, welcome everyone. I think we will give it one more minute and I think we'll, uh, we'll be ready to start. So just give us one more minute. I really love when I see where it's like super stoked. <laughs> it's great. I think we'll, uh, Danielle, just give me the thumbs up. I think we've got a good selection now. So maybe we could start shortly, maybe another minute. Okay. All right, guys, I think, yeah, well, I think we're gonna kick it off. Okay, most of us are here. So fantastic. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paula Oreskovich. I'm the Communications Director for California Wines Canada. On behalf of all of us here today, Danielle Giroux, Celeste Finn, our Quebec representative, Paul Desroches, and myself, we would like to officially welcome you to week two of California Wine Month. We kicked it off last week with an incredible then and now session, which we have recorded and will be made available to you all this week. As most of you know, we'd typically be traveling across Canada at this time, and we'd be seeing you all at our California wine fairs, but because that's not possible, we're going to do it virtually, and we are so happy we are. So in addition to this fabulous masterclass, we're also offering a whole bunch of other things in store and other programming, so be sure to check it out and visit us at calwine.ca. So now let's get to this exciting session we've got planned for you today by introducing our moderator, the amazing Elaine Chukon-Brown. Elaine kicked off this session for us last week with great fanfare, and we continue to be thrilled and honored to have Elaine join us again today. So let me tell you a little, a little bit about Elaine in case you've missed it last week. In 2020, 
Elaine won the prestigious Wine Communicator of the Year Award from IWSC in Vanitaly and was named a wine industry leader in North American wine by Wine Business Monthly. She serves as the American specialist for Jancis Robinson, a columnist for Club uh, Enologique, and is a contributing writer to Wine and Spirits magazine. She also contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine and the fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine, both of which won multiple awards. In 2019, the Wine Industry Network named Elaine one of the nine most inspiring people in wine, and she was shortlisted for the IWSC Wine Communicator of the Year Award. Her writing has been featured in Decanter, World of Fine Wine, The Rob Report, and others, and recommended by Food and Wine, Imbibe, The New York Times, The LA Times, and more. She is considered one of the top interviewers and educators in the global wine industry and has been a celebrated keynote speaker for events worldwide. Prior to her career in wine, Elaine served as the Charles A. Eastman Fellow at Dartmouth College and a Tomlinson Fellow at McGill University. Canada is near and dear to her heart, as we always like to say. Prior to her academic career, Elaine owned her own commercial salmon fishing business in Bristol Bay, Alaska, and the rest of her family continued to be small business owners and commercial fishermen in Alaska. So today we're going to take you on a journey in our second masterclass entitled Classics of California Chardonnay. California leads the world in Chardonnay, its most planted variety. The state was the first in the world to bottle Chardonnay under varietal labeling, establishing the practice for all of the new world. California's unique clonal selections for this variety are now grown around the world and in the cellar, California helped bring greater understanding to new techniques for making more refined and more flavorful expressions of the variety. Today, we have an interactive panel discussion and tasting cons uh, considering California's classics of Chardonnay, its unique history and its range of styles from different parts of the state. So wines we'll be tasting today will be from the following wineries. Gergich Hills, Davis Bynum, Artisa, Wente Vineyards, J. Lohr, and Edna Valley Vineyards. And Elaine will also be joined by three amazing vintners. Thank you for being here with us today. Evo Jamiraz, Director of Winemaking, Gergich Hills, Nikki Wente, the fifth generation winemaker of viticulture at Wente Vineyards, and Kristen Barnizel, winemaker of white wines at J. Lohr. So before I hand it over to Elaine to get started, just wanted to share with you a couple of housekeeping items. As attendees, you will all be muted for the duration of the webinar. However, you will see on your screen that there are two channels for you to communicate with other attendees and pose questions to the panelists. First is a chat session. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other guests and just be sure to select everyone, all panelists and attendees in the to field as it can default to panelists only. Second, the Q&A section. This is where we ask you to please submit any questions you may have for the panel to be answered during the webinar. And if you find yourself with streaming issues, you may wanna encourage other members of your office or household to log off the internet and avoid simultaneous streaming to save bandwidth. You may also wanna log out and try again with another internet server such as Firefox or Chrome. This webinar is being recorded and all of you will receive a link to the video recording and tasting notes in the following days. So let's get into the golden state of mind as you are in for a treat today. Let's get started and escape to California wine country for the next 90 minutes or so. Elaine, I am now turning over this to you. Thanks everyone and I'll see you after the seminar. Thank you so much, Paula. I'm thrilled to be back with you again um, one week later. And I'm also very excited to spend this week focusing on Chardonnay. Chardonnay from California and around the world, actually, is a subject that I have spent quite a bit of time researching and tasting and traveling to understand. And I'm really quite grateful to have um, our three panelists here to help discuss the idea with us. What we've done today is select, we've selected six wines that are going to kind of bring us through different regions of California that really specialize in Chardonnay, as well as a range of styles. Um, we're, we try to select wines that show a real um, full range of styles of Chardonnay from the state and across different price points as well. We're also going to dig into growing conditions um, and farming practices that best support this particular variety. And, um, and we'll get into California's unique history with Chardonnay as well. Something that 
people might not realize is that actually <clears throat> before um, 1936, Chardonnay was only ever labeled regionally. So we all know, of course, white Burgundy is one of the most famous um, sources of Chardonnay in the world. And, and um, prior to California beginning the practice of varietal labeling, actually using the word Chardonnay on the label, around the world, the variety was never named. So wine labels only listed the region in which the wine was made. And in 1936, Wente Vineyards became the first winery in the world to actually put the variety on the label and created a, an, a world trend, which is pretty remarkable. Um, Wente Vineyards also um, is actually one of the most influential wineries in the world in the sense that 80% of all Chardonnay plantings in the state of California actually originate from cuttings taken from Wente Vineyards. And... Um, Additionally, those, those same selections have been exported worldwide and can now be found um, essentially on every continent that grows wine, from, from my recollection. Um, and so Nikki can help us um, understand that a little bit more as well. Now, um, also incredibly, Evo is here with Gurgit Schills, and as many of you know, um, Montalena in um, 1976, contributed the 1973 Montalena Chardonnay to the now world famous event, the Paris tasting. And Mike Gergich, the founder of Gergich Hills, was actually the winemaker of that top winning Chardonnay um, that, that took, took the lead at the Paris tasting. The very next year in um, 1977, he was able to found Gergich Hills. So we have really incredible um, historical depth here in this panel, which I absolutely adore. I think one of the best ways to understand wine today is to is to honor its history as well and to ask how we got to where we are now. And um, I actually, to get us started, I would love to turn to Kristen because Kristen is also in a unique position. She makes wine at Jaylor today and help, leads specifically white winemaking. Her own winemaking experience actually um, includes red wines and a strong focus on vineyards. We have a panel that's really quite focused on farming and viticulture across the board here today, so we can get into that um, really nicely. But what I'd like to start with is just asking Kristen, you know, in, Kristen, in your mind, what really stands out to you about growing white wine in California and wine in general? Is it for those that don't know, Kristen has actually been able to make wine in Italy, in South Africa, in Washington, and mul multiple parts of California as well. I think I got all the key places. And, and so you're in a unique position to comment on what really stands out and defines um, white wine growing in California. Oops, I think you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, I think California is, is very particular and very special in terms of grape growing, um, mostly due to the climate, you know, north to south, we're on the coast here. Uh, during the growing months, the typical growing months, we, we have this kind of morning and evening fog. And as we know, that, that tends to moderate uh, the temperatures and help retain really fresh acidity, for, particularly for Chardonnay and for white wines. Um, and that being said, they're also, and also warm enough that we have a dry, relatively dry climate um, that can help retain fresh fruit flavors throughout the season. So I, I think that's a really great combination that we get cool enough to, to retain that acidity and still grow fresh, uh, you know, uh, fresh clusters and fresh fruit throughout, uh, throughout and bring that through, har through to harvest. Um, as we look at like what we're looking at today, I think very unique that we're looking at, we have the option to have so many different grape growing regions. So you have places that are very cool climate, little pockets that are cool climate and then slightly warmer climate as well and see the different sides of Chardonnay. So I think that is very special to this area in terms of which style you're trying to make to work with the soil and the climates in, in your area to, to bring out the best fruit and your particular style possible. Yeah, great. Thank you. One of the things that is commonly said about Chardonnay is that it's a neutral variety and that it, it really takes the winemaker's hand. I actually disagree with that. I've spent um, really quite a lot of time, as I said, in my um, wine career focused on tasting Chardonnay, talking to Chardonnay growers and producers all over the world. And my view is actually that 
Chardonnay is one of the most powerfully expressive of both site and cellar. And that makes the site quality especially important and the farming um, practices especially important. And it's actually, um, we can think of almost something like a comparison of strong sites to weak sites. And it's in the weak sites that cellar takes over and becomes the dominant expression of a wine. But in a strong site, you'll equally see um, the, reg the regional on site growing characteristics showing through the cellar practices as well. And I think that that dance is part of what makes Chardonnay such a fascinating variety to study because as we kind of push into what's unique about Chardonnay, we have really kind of the greatest opportunity of almost any wine variety in the world to learn about that relationship between farming and cellar practices. So I'm excited to get into that today. Um, so Celeste, if we could pull up just the first basic California map, we'll just kind of remind ourselves of some of the key characteristics here. So this is just a very simple overview map of California. It helps give us a sense of the key um, major regions of the state. We're going to be focusing today really on the coastal parts of California, North Coast and Central Coast. And we're going to go um, a pretty good length of the way down North Coast and Central Coast and talk through kind of the history of this variety and the unique growing conditions that help deliver this range of styles that we're talking about. And so what I'd love to do, though, to get us started is just to pop back out and turn to Evo and because you know, the comment that I just made about how Chardonnay is so incredibly expressive of site and that that makes farming really especially important. Evo, you've really devoted your career to regenerative farming in particular. So not just farming to, to grow grapes, but actually farming to preserve old vines. Gurgich has some of the oldest vines in Napa Valley, actually. Um, and, um, and really, you know, really beautiful, impressive vineyards. I've been able to spend several days even um, kind of walking vineyards with you and really getting to know how you're farming. And I was hoping that you could talk to us about that relationship of regenerative farming to wine quality and, and how you try to bring that into the work that you do. Thank you for that uh, question, Aline. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here presenting Napa Valley. Uh, uh, the people of Canada are favorite customers. Uh, my daughter Maya, who's here next to me, uh, is uh, visiting uh, uh, in a good day old days. Uh, he would, uh, she would uh, visit the Canada a few times a year and will continue that. So it's uh, Canada is our major market. So I really appreciate uh, being included in this. Uh, as far as uh, grape growing is concerned, Elaine, uh, you are absolutely right. At Gurgic Hills, we try to create authentic wine wine of terroir. Uh, there's a reason why for centuries they didn't bother putting Chardonnay in Burgundy. They thought, uh, we know that that's best uh, variety to express our terroir. And then uh, for, for uh, so many years, they tried to prove that there's only good terroir in Burgundy. I believe there's great terroirs all around the world, just they have to be discovered. So we have a uh, wonderful uh, geology here in Napa Valley or, or in California in particular, uh, due to hundreds of millions of years of earthquakes, volcanoes, tectonic movements, and then unbeatable climate. Uh, I don't think it's getting much hotter uh, in California. Uh, when I came here 35 years ago, I uh, was as hot as today. Winters are slightly warmer, but I think, I believe that Pacific Ocean that is overwhelmingly cold all year round is mod moderating uh, our temperature. I believe global warming is far worse in Europe than here in uh, uh, California. So back to farming. Uh, we never like chemicals. Uh, before second, we, were, we are Croatian and, uh, Croatians. My uncle was born in a small village in Croatia. He was shepherd. So when I introduced sheep to our vineyard, uh, he was thrilled because uh, now he feels at home finally. Uh, and uh, we never believed in chemicals. And for many years, we've been uh, organic, bionomic, and uh, as of late, regenerative. Uh, even with organic, bionomic farming, not every while well, soil improved or soil organic matter uh, was much higher. We doubled it in 10 years. Uh, bacteria in soil also uh, was present more than ever. Still, we had to fight mildew in this uh, Carneros American Canyon vineyard where we grow Chardonnay. 
Needless to say, uh, there is so many viruses that everybody is replanting vineyards. If you come to Napa Valley today, uh, average vineyard can last only 22 years, which is tragedy. And I believe strongly it's overwhelmingly due to, to farming, how we farm. Uh, so with the, with the, uh, I, for me, discovering regenerative farming is most important discovery in my 35 years of aggregate shills. I believe finally we have a chance uh, to grow incredibly beautiful uh, vines, with flavorful vines, and we can fight diseases. If you're a farmer, there's nothing worse than dealing with diseases. You do everything right, and you see that there's a, this disease or virus that you have to take um, a vineyard out. So also we put high premium on older vines. Uh, and uh, you, you saw our vineyards, our oldest Zinfandel is over 120 years old. Our uh, backbone, our Cabernet vineyard, the Antwil is 61 years old. Chardonnay is uh, uh, over 30 years old grape vines. So it is possible to do that with the proper farming. And uh, so missing link, I believe, uh, uh, in organic farming, uh, even biodynamic was two things. No till, I believe you should never till your vineyard. And secondly, you have to incorporate livestock. Uh, so we are mimicking most productive soil in the United States, which is Midwest, uh, created uh, by, by bison and grass. So we try to mimic uh, how most fertile soil was created in the world. And it's working and um, I am uh, thrilled with the results. That's great, thank you. I, and just to clarify, um, regenerative farming, um, you know, is, so we, uh, people are aware of organic um, farming, um, which specifically excludes um, kind of synthetic chemicals in the vineyard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Biodynamic farming adds a layer of um, treatments and preparations that are kind of made um, with natural products. Um, it strongly encourages the presence of animals in the vineyard. And then what's the piece that you would add, Evo, just briefly to, to distinguish regenerative farming as its, as its own focus as well? Major focus on a, a microbiome, microbes in soil. That's a missing component. That every, every uh, natural, good natural system uh, is based on a symbiosis between plants and microbes. With our today's farming with fertilizers, Roundup, we kill microbes, we expose soil. You look at nature, unless you're in Sahara, nature wants to cover itself. So, uh, so our soil has to be covered. Yes, in California, it won't be green growing cover crops in uh, August, uh, but uh, we can have straw. Uh, temperature can be 30, 40 of a soil. Top soil can be 30, 40 degrees cooler. If you have a little mulch, then, then cultivate soil. And then animal component is obviously enhancing microbes. Uh, so uh, when you include all that, then uh, now more than ever, it's important to do proper farming. Not only that, uh, that uh, uh, once you have more microbes and, and good species of cover crop, infiltration of water is greatly enhanced. This year in uh, that Canaro Vineyard, we only had seven inches of water. How the heck do we survive with that? Uh, we can, uh, when you have a good structure soil that every, every inch of that water is cut, it's not run of water. So by doing all these things, uh, you are improving structure and water holding capacity of water. And, and this is also helping in these difficult conditions. While I don't think there is a huge warming effect here in Napa Valley, but there is, uh, from one year, from 55 inches of rain, one year, we go to seven next year. So this, these are from one very cold vintage, 18 or 19, to very hot, 20 vintage. So there's these extremes. And when you do this kind of farming, uh, I think you are in better shape to handle those extremes. Thank you. So one of the things that I think, uh, one way to think about the shift in attention that's gone and happened in grape growing recently, um, post World War II, there is this great uh, realization that we could actually choose, uh, we could manage the chemistry of our various activities and especially with farming. So, so you could sort of think of it as if post World War II, there's this sort of revolution of the, of the use of chemistry and there's a real strong uh, chemistry focus in winemaking and in wine growing. And in more recent last 10 or 15 years, the shift has moved from chemistry to biology. And so there's a greater awareness uh, that the biome as Evo mentioned is really crucial and that the health of vines is going, and is going to come from paying attention to the biology of the soil 
not just the life of the plant. But Nikki, a question has come in um, from Marie Claire uh, asking, um, what are some of the co common maladies of the vines spe that specifically affect Chardonnay? Um, Kristen sort of hinted at some and Evo hinted at some, but, but um, Nikki, you're, you, know, you have a focus on viticulture as well. And so I was hoping you could clarify that for us. So, sorry, I'm, uh, the, what are some of the qualities the, that- The maladies, the kind of um, the, you know, so different like mildew issues or other diseases oh. that could come up with Chardonnay. Sorry, I thought we were talking about the clone. Going yeah. back yeah, to, so, okay. Yeah, so mildew is certainly the biggest problem, I think, with Chardonnay across the board. Um, we want to provide everyone with the cleanest fruit possible. So really focusing, especially in a regenerative farming sense, you would be focusing on um, mildew models that are looking at climate over the season and predicting when the mildew is going to be at its highest pressure so that you can treat on those days specifically rather than having to treat um, as a preventative measure, just treat when it's actually coming um, close. And then we also have a lot of virus problems just across California. Um, specifically, uh, grapevine mealybug has transmitted leaf roll um, to uh, pretty much every end of California at this point. Um, so leaf roll is a huge problem. Um, and then red blotch, of course, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of red blotch. It's a big problem. It's not quite as big of a problem in Chardonnay, but what it does is it in increases the pH of the uh, sub subsequent wine. So you start to lose acidity, um, but it, you're not losing acidity in the um, titratable acidity. So if your TA is really high and your pH is also high. Um, so when you add more acid back in the winemaking process, your TA is only going higher. You're not really adjusting the pH too much. Um, so that is the negative of red blotch specifically. Um, so you really want to try and keep your grapevines as clean as possible. Um, we're doing a lot of vector studies to see what's actually transmitting the red blotch um, with UCANR, which is great uh, that people are really investing a lot of energy into it. Um, and then besides that, uh, we have really big problems with Utypa in Livermore specifically, which is a fungal pathogen that spreads during pruning season. Um, so for that, we usually just come around with a, um, uh, an application of either an oil-based product to try and stop the spread of Utypa or stop the infection process right after we do a pruning event um, or prune later in the season also. We just can't prune everything later in the season. Right. So some blocks we have to do the preventative methods to try and stay in front of Utypa spreading. Um, it's, it's like a, a trunk disease that will eventually spread down and, and kill the vine. Um, so it's, it's never easy farming, but that's why we love it. <laughs> There's always something new that we are, we're learning or a different method of trying to prevent some of these things from happening um, while always focusing on, you know, the sustainable way to farm. I know um, JLOR as well as Gurgage, we're always looking, and Wente Vineyards, we're always looking for the next best way to do something that's less impactful to the planet or to our neighbors or to our employees, you know, just thinking about the whole scope and how we can make it better for everyone, including the life cycle of the vine. <laughs> well, and part of why we specifically um, were so happy to have the three of you be on the panel today is because you, you're, um, each of your wineries really has been for, very forward looking in, the, in terms of sustainability efforts, not only with farming, but also with people. And I think remembering that sustainability must be economical and it must be taking care of its people. It's such an important part. It's not only an, an environmental choice, though obviously it is that as well. And I'd also like to point out that um, they're all three family, multi-generational family-owned wineries, which is pretty exciting and, and great to see. So let's go ahead and start tasting wine. Um, Celeste, if we could go ahead and just see the, um, the original California map real just briefly, and then we'll, and then we'll shift to Napa Valley um, and, and talking about this, the first wine, Gergich. Great. So again, as I mentioned last time, the one of the key things to remember about California is that right off the coast, coming from the north, bordering the almost the entire length of the state, we have the cold um, California current coming down from Alaska, and it is a profoundly strong weather influence for the state. And then very importantly, we have that San Francisco Bay complex. And um, San Francisco Bay obviously is well known, but San Pablo Bay is connected to it as well. 
And as I mentioned last time, I won't talk about it as, as long this time, but the Central Valley has a really strong um, climate impact on the state because it's such an enormously long valley that as temperatures rise in the inland valleys or Central Valley, as we've been calling it, um, that hot air literally rises and it needs to pull in air to just fill in that gap down by the ground. And the only place it can really pull that air in effectively is through the Golden Gate across the San Francisco, San Pablo Bay complex through the California Delta. And then it fills in that entire expanse of the Central Valley. And the reason that that matters today is because as I was saying, the Central Valley and that California Delta Bay complex, they create a kind of daily breathing effect that informs weather through the entire state and very importantly through each of the regions that we're gonna talk about today. So if we can advance to the Napa map, what you'll notice here is that you can only just glimpse it, but at the very bottom corner of the Napa Valley Appalachian as seen here, that's the San Pablo Bay. There's a little bit of water there right in the very, very south. And the point of that is to show that Napa Valley is sitting on top of that powerful bay complex that I mentioned. And so it's actually relatively close to the opening into to the ocean. And it, the southernmost part of Napa Valley sits right in the pathway of that breathing apparatus that I was talking about, where you get daily airflow from the ocean across the bays and all the way into the Central Valley. And this first wine that we're gonna talk about, the two vineyards that, that inform and create the um, estate Chardonnay from Gurgut Shills are there, you can see Carneros is the slightly brown um, nested AVA at the very bottom most part of Napa Valley. And a little bit southwest of it, sitting just above the bay is the second vineyard planted in the American Canyon area. And so um, Evo, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about these areas. Um, Kristen mentioned the importance of fog. Each of the regions we're gonna talk about today are really powerfully informed by fog and especially um, again, this American Canyon Los Carneros area. So could you tell us a little bit about the vineyards that go into this first wine, Evo? Yes, so the soil in a, a typical soil in South Napa is uh, based on clay. Once upon a time, most likely that was a bay and there was a settling uh, uh, fine particles which formed clay, which uh, obviously you do not want only clay, but uh, clay is good for, for, for Chardonnay. Uh, climate uh, is much cooler in South Napa, I would say 10 to 15 degrees on any, any summer day than in Yantville or uh, Rutherford. So this is amazing. In Europe, you will have to travel 500 uh, miles from South to, to North to experience difference, this kind of difference in climate. In Napa Valley, only 30 miles. So every, we get strong winds and uh, typically uh, we get lots of fog, uh, which is not only uh, uh, has cooling effect uh, uh, on our uh, climate, but also brings 100% humidity. Needless to say, uh, grapevine, grapevine leaves can absorb some of that moisture. And while we have nice warm day, uh, nights are cool and uh, fresh. So acidity in Chardonnay is crucial. Uh, 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 white wine like Chardonnay, uh, they don't have virtually, no, they have no tannins. And so structure of Chardonnay depends on that acidity. Uh, I, I over, a bit oversimplified everything, but acidity is very crucial for at least style of wine that, uh, that uh, we make. So we are thrilled with both, uh, both sides. Uh, soil is not just clay. We have in American Canyon pure sand, like beach sand. And uh, it's mind boggling just a few hundred feet apart how soil can be different. So we do have very diverse uh, soils uh, in all California and Napa in particular. Well, so, I, Evo, I want to be sure to mention, um, my recollection is that you're actually able to dry farm Chardonnay in, in at least some of these areas. Yeah, most of uh, most Chardonnay in Carneros, which has a bit more clay and slightly bit more rainfall uh, uh, is, is dry farm. Uh, we could dry farm everything, uh, but uh, do I want a raisin on Chardonnay when it uh, gets toward the end? No. So uh, while we can farm and harvest grapes, wouldn't be uh, to kind of standards that we want. We do not want overripe, overripe Chardonnay. Uh, we want fully ripe Chardonnay, but uh, we don't like high alcohol. So in that sense, especially if you have sandy soil, which can hold very, uh, uh, very little water, clay holds much more water than sandy soil. 
then we have to put some water, never more than maybe, let's say, maximum irrigation is only 20 gallons uh, per plant per year in a, in a worse drought year. So it's relatively small, minor amount. One time uh, I argued with some uh, winemaker from Burgundy and he said, how dare you even call your wine, great wine, when you're watering guys during summer. Then I asked him to provide me with the rainfall in, in Burgundy from a bud break to harvest. It's about 10 times more than, than what we water here. So of course, why would you water if you're getting rain every two weeks? In California, typically I, there have be, been few harvests. Uh, vintages that uh, from bud break to, to harvest, we haven't seen one inch of rain and we still uh, survive. But it's crucial to this proper farming, uh, to do this farming that uh, you develop do deep root system. In July, uh, first the two feet you dig down, there is no water. But if you dig third, fourth, fifth feet, yes, there is water. So key is to get those roots deeper in soil. That's why using fertilizers and watering first year when you plant your vineyard is deadly. So back to, the, to this vintage, uh, uh, we are tasting today 2017, uh, which was uh, obviously very interesting vintage in terms of rainfall and, and uh, heat. Uh, it's not supposed to be great uh, vintage for white wine due to uh, 2017 was one of the hottest uh, uh, years in Napa Valley here, but we had 55 inches of rain that year and uh, uh, there was so much moisture in soil that I think uh, it offset, uh, offset the heat and uh, we retain nice acidity. Uh, as I mentioned, acidity already five times. Uh, we at Gurgit Schultz, we do not put our Chardonnay through malolactic fermentation, uh, not because it's wrong. It's totally appropriate if you have high acid. In this case, we just have enough acidity. Our acid here is probably six, eight, or maybe seven grams, and we like it uh, at, that, in that range. And uh, uh, which is uh, again so necessary for a style of wine that we like to 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 make a restrained, uh, elegant, mineral-driven Chardonnay. So we pick Chardonnay at night, and uh, uh, the whole cluster press. And then uh, the key also component of our wine making is uh, uh, wild yeast. We never put any yeast or yeast food in. Our fermentations are a bit slower. It might take three to four weeks. Uh, but uh, we know that we are fermenting with hundreds and hundreds of different species, uh, strains of uh, Saccharomyces versus one single strain from the bag that you have to feed with uh, you know, a bunch of nutrients. The result is more interesting uh, wine. If you want to make authentic wine, wine that uh, you can link to uh, wine with a sense of place, I believe it's very essential to use uh, uh, natural wild yeast uh, that uh, you have um, on your grapes. Uh, for many years, our uh, University Davis uh, taught uh, that you're crazy if you're not using commercial yeast. So they're not totally wrong. If you're using uh, uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic fungicides, uh, chemicals on your grapes, not only that you kill all these uh, uh, wild yeast, but also have a residue. So you, I think you are better off by using uh, strong inoculum of of, of this uh, uh, purchased yeast. But if you are organic and you don't killing your yeast and you don't have this residue, it's totally doable uh, to do uh, this kind of uh, uh, fermentation. Uh, overall, uh, 17 is a reflection of, uh, of uh, that warm year. It, for Gurgit Pils, it's uh, a bit more creamy than our normal Chardonnay. Uh, it be interesting to, to have 18, which was totally the opposite, very cool, modest rainfall and cool vintage. So uh, contrary to popular beliefs that all our vintages are similar in California, we do have uh, variations. They are overwhelming we do to how much rain we got and how hot it gets during summer. So, so uh, this is a more kind of uh, creamier, richer, uh, nuttier style of Chardonnay than we have in a, a cooler vintage. So I, so I will say that um, I, how, you know, ha having been lucky enough to do some vertical tastings with you, Evo, I recognize the point that you're making saying it's creamier for what's typical of Gurgit mm -hmm. but I would not in any way call this a creamy wine. It's, it's very crisp, but it's like, and one of the things I really love about it is how savory it is. Like you have this sense of fruit purity that yeah. sort of forms the heart of the wine. And then there's this kind of undergirding of like wonderful savory character. And Nikki and Kristen, I know you both have the wine there as well. Nikki, I'd love to hear what, what really stands out to you about the wine as you taste it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I really love this wine. Um, as I was getting some um, aromas from it, I, I originally got just like a lot of fresh apple and then there's like a background of some pineapple for me that I really loved. Um, and then on the, on the palate, I thought there was this nice caramelization. It has a really great texture and then it, it leaves you wanting more. I, like it's like this mouth watering succulent feeling that mm -hmm. makes you want to come back and take another sip, which is exactly why I love Chardonnay mm -hmm. um, when it gives you that sort of sensation. So I, I think it's a, a absolutely wonderful wine that definitely does um, show the sense of place of that uh, Carneros area down into American Canyon. Um, it, it's beautiful. Thank you. Kristen, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, sure, yes, I, I would agree. It's, it's a beautiful, really very well balanced wine. For, I just got that nice minerality on the on the nose. It's a really classic representation of, of Chardonnay, I think. The apple um, got a little lemon lemon peel uh, as you get into the into the palate. But really, what surprised me was the level of acidity and 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 the texture it was a really nice balance across the palate and finish. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so we're going to keep hearing from all three panelists throughout this seminar. But let's just to manage time, let's go ahead and take a look at the second wine, Celeste. If we could pull up the map for. Sonoma County. So now what we've done here is um, in, we've set up a contrast between the first and the second wine. The first wine has no malolactic fermentation. The second wine is mal does have malolactic fermentation, but also, um, um, you know, Napa and Sonoma are both known for um, Chardonnay. And so we've, um, with the second wine, we've, we've um, pulled kind of one of the classic wine regions, a Chardonnay from Russian River Valley. And on this map, Celeste can highlight where the, the it's, this is all, uh, also a vineyard designated wine from the River West Vineyard made by Davis um, Bynum. And this particular vineyard, it's on West Side Road, which I think of as really the historical heart of the Russian River. It's, um, it's, a really, it's a relatively cool area of the Russian River Valley. It's very river influenced, um, very um, high draining alluvial soils. And extremely fog influence. Now, Kristen, I know you grew up not that far from there. Do you want to add any comments about like what really stands out to you about that area of Russian River? Um, sure, I think I would, I would add to that in terms of most days being quite cool with the fog coming in. Um, there is some influence I know in that, in that area even, um, yeah, the high water mark for Russian River in, in years past in the 60s has, has been, you know, even underwater sometimes. In the in those areas, um, and and also the tree influence. I think th that's uh, much of that area is covered by the redwoods, and so yeah. a lot a, um, a lot of uh, diversity. In, I think in those vineyards too. Yeah. So two years ago, you know, we had a, an enormous um, rain um, in very short succession. We had an enormous series of storms, and I actually had uh, quite a few visits set up along West Side Road, and we had to postpone all of them because West Side Road was underwater. <laughs> And so this whole, uh, that vineyard area, it's, um, it's, it's quite cool, like nice, long, even days and the surrounding trees. That's such an important thing to mention, as Chris, Kristen said, because um, people are very aware that bodies of water are moderating influences, but actually the kinds of forests that we have here in Northern California create their own microclimates as well and are, and are also moderating influences on the climate. And so that, that West side of um, Russian River is surrounded by forests. The, the vineyards are kind of tucked into the forest and that helps create more even, um, even temperatures through the course of the season. So let's go ahead and look at the second wine. So again, this is the Davis Bynum River West Vineyard. Uh, River West Vineyard is on West Side Road, as I mentioned, sandy loam with lots of gravel, so pretty free draining. This particular wine was um, aged relatively similar amount of time in barrel as as the Gergich. Um, but this particular wine went did go entirely through ML. And there was actually also monthly botanage. They were really intentionally intentionally um, stirring the lees in barrel through that entire year of aging in barrel in order to build the mid palate and create a purposeful sense of creaminess. So there is an intentional stylistic contrast to what we were seeing in the um, in the first wine from Evo. And um, Kristen, I believe you said you have this wine with you as well. I'd love to hear I, what stands out to you. 
I do. Well, as, as you mentioned, it's, it is uh, fully through malolactic. So that I think that's the first thing that really comes to mind is really this nice uh, luscious creaminess mm -hmm. melding a little bit with the oak that's in this wine. Uh, get a little bit of that caramel kind of flavor. Um, a little bit of baked apple, a little bit of baking spices. There's a little more, yeah, so this is about 30% new um, oak. They're, the um, barrels are from France as well as Eastern Europe. So, so it's all European oak, but, um, but Eastern Europe is represented here as, as well as French oak. And there, this wine has a more intentional oak presence. I don't, it's, um, and so you get that little bit of sweetness and spice um, that, that you mentioned, Kristen. Um, and, but it, the, um, the clonal selections here, um, we're used to talking about clones quite a bit with Pinot. It's quite relevant with Chardonnay as well. And um, the clonal selections here are quite interesting in that they're, they have intentionally selected two highly aromatic expressions of, of um, Chardonnay. So one is, um, clone 809, which is a Dijon clone. Um, it's considered to be a Musquet clone, which is to say it's very, it's a very floral top note aromatic sort of um, expression of Chardonnay. And the other one is actually the Spring Mountain selection, which is one of California's heritage selections that's considered also be Musquet like very, um, again, high tone um, aromatic. But a Spring Mountain selection actually goes back, um, from what I recall, all the way to the Wente Vineyard. And I think, it, Kristen, this would be a great time for you to just briefly tell us that story of the Wente selection and what makes it so unique. Did you or say Kristen Nikki? or Nikki? I'm sorry. Or I, Nikki. I, I said Nikki. Kristen, but I was uh, yeah. looking at Nikki. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Nikki, I'd love to, <laughs> I'd yeah, love no. to hear that from you. No problem. Um, so back in... 1908, actually, or I'll jump back even further. So in the 1880s, California appointed the first viticultural commissioner for the state of California. And basically what his, his name was Charles Wetmore. And what his job was to do is to spread education about viticulture, how to kind of bring life into this industry. Um, we had a bad reputation at that point for just having a lot of lower quality wine grapes planted um, that were producing wines that weren't up to the standards of the French and other countries. So what Charles Wetmore did in his role was he actually went out to France in the 1880s and was able to go to some of the most pre premier vineyards in France and bring back cuttings to California. And he lived in Livermore, uh, which is where my family's winery is. Um, so a lot of those cuttings that he brought back went to wineries in Livermore and the surrounding towns, but others went across the state of California, including Napa, Sonoma, et cetera. Um, so from there in 1908, my uh, grandfather was going to school at UC Davis and a great, great grandfather or great grandfather, excuse me, <laughs> um, was going to UC Davis and one of his teachers was very interested in Chardonnay. So um, he found a little block of Chardonnay in Pleasanton, California, which is just next door to Livermore and was able to plant four acres um, on our property from cuttings he pulled from there in 1908. It was the Theodore Gear Vineyard. Um, and those cuttings that he got were the original from Charles Wetmore in the 1880s. Um, and then from there, after the first vintage, uh, our grand, or his father loved the Chardonnay so much that he asked him to head off to France with one of his professors to bring back more cuttings from uh, the um, nursery at... Uh, um, LEA. Montpellier. Yes, Montpellier. Yeah. Thank you. I yeah. was like, why am I blanking? Yeah. Um, uh, so from there, we were able to continue kind of growing the stock of Chardonnay. Um, and then soon after Prohibition hit. Um, so we were lucky enough to have a partnership with Full U Winery, who was doing all the sacramental and medicinal wines um, to provide just white wine. So we were giving them white wine for sacramental and medicinal purposes through prohibition, um, which allowed us to continue to grow our stock of Chardonnay during a time where people were ripping out a lot of varietals. Um, my grandfather had the, or great grandfather had this uh, love for Chardonnay and just kind of watching the vine physiology, how the shoots are growing, how the clusters, how, what the cluster morphology looks like and tasting the berries. And he would be marking with different colored tape throughout the season of the vines like, oh, this one grows much quicker than the rest. Or this one has beautiful leaf uh, shape and structure. And this one has wonderful cluster shape. And then as soon as he would taste them uh, during ripening and find the, the 
clusters that were tasting wonderful, he would put the final ring of tape and that would be the one that he is gonna propagate from. So he would take wood from that plant during dormancy to continue growing the stock of Chardonnay. Um, so flash forward to when everyone is looking to plant Chardonnay, um, we, we had quite a bit of Chardonnay on our property and um, he pretty much opened the gates and said, you know, anyone that's interested is welcome to come to property and take their cuttings and, and start to plant from there. Um, we also partnered with UC Davis to do some cleanup of our uh, grapevines as well to spread clean grape stock as they were looking at um, heat treatment and other uh, ways to try and get rid of some of the viruses. Um, but through that, it kind of was lovingly called the Wenti clone, even though it's probably more like the Wenti selection because it didn't all come from one parent, um, but it's just a number of different parents that ended up producing a really similar flavor. Um, we really look for three unique flavors um, in our Chardonnay now. We, we have some that are really leaning towards the Musquet, um, some that are leaning towards, you know, a green apple or, or Fuji honey crisp apple, and then some that are going towards that more tropical, what my dad likes to call oily banana, which is not at all appetizing, but I swear once you once you hear it and then you taste it, you're like, I think I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of, we have still actually have vineyards on our property that we've been doing the same the same ritual as my great grandfather um, have never left the property have just been from that original block. Uh, we actually have about 30 acres right now um, that all are original originated from that original block in 1908 and 1912. Um, so it's pretty cool tradition and I'm very happy that we were able to kind of pass along some Chardonnay stock to the rest of the state because there are some amazing Chardonnays out there now yeah, and as a so Chardonnay so. girl it's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> that's great thank you so let's go ahead and look at the third wine as well. So this wine from Arteza is um, is unique in that it's actually, so we mentioned um, with the Gurgit Chills, we have a no mallow Chardonnay, the second wine from Davis Bynum, we have a full mallow Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And then with this third wine, Arteza, we have a 50, 50. Um, so they allowed um, half the lots to go through ML and, and half the lots they chose not to go through ML. Um, and they also, this is unique as well in that in this particular wine, 85% um, of the fruit was fermented in French oak, 30% of it was new, but they held back 15% in stainless. And one of the questions that came in was kind of to what degree are people using oak versus not oak in California? There's been a lot of experimentation kind of covering that whole range, um, fermentation in oak, fermentation in tank, and then aging in oak. Um, fermentation and with some aging in oak and then moving to stainless steel. And this wine represents sort of a mix of techniques. Um, and if we could actually pull up the, the map on Carneros too, we'll just briefly touch on it again. Um, you know, as Evo mentioned, um, this area, there's a good amount of clay in Carneros, but, but the Arteza wine is from a unique part of Carneros. Um, as we can see in this map, the Carneros AVA or Los Carneros, um, as it appears on, on labels, is unique in that it actually sits on both the Sonoma County side and the Napa Valley County side. And so that brown line that Celeste is highlighting is the Napa Sonoma County border. And this particular wine is um, from fur a little further north in Carneros than, than the area that Evo described. This interesting peninsula looking um, section of the AVA in Carneros is actually um, hugged right up against the side of Mount Beter Appalachian. And so the Arteza um, blocks that this fruit is from are, are planted on slopes in what you could almost call the foothills of Mount Beter. And so it's a relatively gravelly area. Um, the vines are around 20 years old. And interestingly, the, um, the range of clonal material is um, mainly California heritage vines that do um, come originally from Wente. So um, we have the Martini, the Hyde, and the Robert Young selections, which are all um, heritage selections, and then also Dijon 76, um, which it gives a little bit more of a, a pure fruit note. And then Kristen, I believe you have the Arteza as well? I do, I do. Do you mind, do you mind commenting on that? Sure, sure. 
I think for me, uh, uh, working with Clone 76, uh, as we will see in the Arroyo Vista that we're that we're showing today, you get that really nice apple kind of uh, Meyer lemon, very high toned mm -hmm. fruits. There's something really intriguing that's almost like a honeysuckle on the nose. That's really uh, it just just again very attractive. But you really get the freshness on this wine from that 50/50 Mallow that you that you were talking about. I think from the, from that stainless portion and um, a little bit of maybe tangerine. Uh, I think for me. And then um, really good texture. I think I think it's got great texture in the front palate, and really good acidity to kind of, to carry it through. Wine is interesting to me too because you get the you get some fullness on the mid palate, and then it just like snaps tight at the mm -hmm. finish. And I feel like mm -hmm. it's that combo again that um, fifty percent mallow with um, and then fifty percent blocks. You know, gives you that textural combination where it sort of fills your mouth and then swoosh, it just snaps <laughs> snaps down shut shut at the end um so um as evo was describing this was also done with a natural ferment but they very intentionally controlled the temperature in order to keep the fermentation quite cool and the part of why um, some producers choose to do that is because when you um lower the fermentation temperature and sort of control it to stay cool you tend to preserve more of the aromatics and that real um fruit pure fruit marker um is how i i I'm embarrassed i'm saying this in front of a bunch of winemakers but um um that's my understanding of it and the um and again they they have used a combination of techniques here with some some fermentation in wood and then some in stainless steel but eva one of the questions that came in um what is about um kind of typical yields um you know at harvest or with these varieties and i think because we're about to move into kind of central coast conversation before we leave the north coast it'd be great to ask you you know what are sort of typical yields at harvest that you're seeing um from the vineyards that you work with and also kind of bricks levels that you tend to tend to see as ideal for your area yes uh, and i also saw questions somebody asked me which clones do we have at Gergich? Uh, overwhelmingly all vented thank you nikki uh that's my <laughs> favorite one uh then uh we have uh, clone 15 which is Prosser clone from washington uh and uh, something called robert young another famous grower from sonoma so he developed also it's based on all venti mm -hmm. and then we have uh, some uh uh, clone four that uh, obviously was uh, had better rep, uh, reputation, but if uh, you dry farm it and vineyard is 30 years old and the uh, uh, yields are only three, four tons, uh, it's actually high acidic. Uh, uh, that clone retains most acidity, even more than 20. So we have some of clone four. Yields are typically, uh, we just broke all records in 2018. 18, uh, these, some of these clones that never yielded uh, uh, more than three tons gave us four and a half. This is over 30 year old vineyard. So yields are typically on a low, low year, like 2017 was very due to drought, very low yielding year, two and a half uh, to three tons. On a bumper crop year, like 18, we had four and a half tons. And these are all, uh, again, from vineyards over 30 years old. Yeah, which is pretty, says a lot about the health of the vines. That's um... That's great to hear. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and so Clone 108, for those that are <laughs> clone geeks, cl um, Clone 108 and Clone 4 actually originate as Wenti, and that, that then went to Davis and were heat treated as well. So it's all going back to Nikki and her, her family, ultimately. <laughs> so um, uh, Celeste, if we could pull up the Central Coast map, because we're going to start shifting, um, again, staying on the coastal parts of California, but now moving down south. And and as we talked about last time, the Central Coast is really um, quite, uh, actually, if we, if we could go forward once and then we'll come back to Livermore, that would be great. Um, yeah, great, this is great. So this just gives us a view of the Central Coast. You can see it's an, it's an enormously long area of California. It starts um, the north of San Francisco, um, but south of the Golden Gate and goes all the way down to Santa Barbara County and, and the, the bottom of the county line there all the way down. So, but what we're talking about now is Livermore and we're gonna zone into a Livermore map in a second. But Celeste, if you could just kind of circle the area to the east of San Francisco Bay, that'll give us a feel for where Livermore is located. So all the way at the top of the central coast in the San Francisco Bay area to the east of San Francisco Bay um, is uh, that that eastern side, the East Bay area is where um, 
Livermore is located. And so now if we could go back to the Livermore map, um, one of the key points about Livermore, so this is kind of the northernmost part of the central coast um, region of California. And um, Nikki alluded to this earlier, but, but historically Livermore was really the epicenter of fine wine uh, nurseries for the state of California. And so, you know, historically um, California in the 1800s really had to get to know how to make quality wine. But by the end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s pre-prohibition, Livermore really became the epicenter of fine wine in the state of California. And one of the key ways that it did that, all of the, um, the best nurseries in California really were situated in Livermore. And so vine cuttings were spread um, throughout the state from there. And so a lot of our, um, what we think of today as fine wine varieties actually do stretch all the way back to Livermore. And the Wente story, of course, is part of that. And now I know Nikki, um, uh, Livermore there, it's very profoundly Bay influenced and um, it is on the Eastern side of the Bay. So it's slightly protected from the coldest parts of that cold California current off the coast. But there's two key openings there in that, um, if you look at this map, you can see Livermore is sort of encircled by mountains, but there's two key openings that um, on the Western side of Livermore um, that, yeah, so there's one, there's a little kind of canyon valley type opening and then Sonal down uh, just a little bit further south of that. Those two key openings make Livermore actually quite fog influenced as well. Could you just briefly tell us about that and then we'll look at the wine? Yeah, absolutely. So um, those who have visited Cal or California or San Francisco, it's quite cold in San Francisco. Everyone always says the coldest summer I ever spent was my summer in San Francisco. Um, it really doesn't get warm until October, which is interesting in itself, but um, that cool air comes over in the morning time, but it allows uh, the nice little kind of pocket that we're in with the mountains around us, allow the cool air to kind of dissipate over the day and we can get some nice warm temperatures. Um, but then at night we get really strong winds that pull through from uh, the San Francisco Bay through those two different passes and really cool off our evenings. Um, and it allows for us to a have a really short hot period of the day. So like I, I think, uh, was it Kristen? Someone mentioned uh, a really hot 2017, Maybe it was Evo, I can't remember. Um, 2017, there was a couple really hot days um, and we were very fortunate because even with the hot days, there were some great winds. So at the hottest hour of the day, it's only like 30 minutes in that heat and then it starts to drop. So we have that really nice wind chill factor from San Francisco, which is super critical uh, when you're getting higher temperatures because the less amount of time your cluster zone is getting too hot, the better it is to retain acidity and for overall um, color in red grapes as well. Um, so that nice cool wind breeze really helps at night and we'll sometimes see a 40 degree temperature swing in the summer days where it's like 90 during the day and then gets down all the way to like 45 in the middle of the night. So it's a huge diurnal shift, um, which allows our Chardonnay to get nice and ripe from the daytime temperatures, but then retain that nice acidity and also drive some minerality from our, we have really deep gravel soils in Livermore Valley um, that can help to, to bring out some of that uh, terroir in the Chardonnay. Well, then let's go ahead and look at the wine map for this particular wine. Um, so now this, um, so this particular, you know, Wente makes um, four different styles of Chardonnay. And this particular example, the morning fog is named for that fog influence that Nikki was describing coming in through those gaps in, uh, in the mountains into the Livermore Valley. And, and so it's really meant to capture how you, you get that combination of just enough sunlight during the day to develop flavor, but then that fog that really helps retain acidity as well. And um, Nikki, I think of the morning fog as, as a wine that really is wanting to over deliver it with value, you know, that it's really about um, kind of being approachable and friendly and yet still having that, that crisp acid line at the same time. It's an incredible value that helps represent the region. Do you want to add more to, to that, the kind of the style and intention behind the wine? Yeah, absolutely. So this wine is another 50-50 um, wine. So we have 50 of it, 50% 50 that goes through malolactic and 50 that does not. However, the 50 that goes through malolactic is all in barrel. And then the 50 that doesn't go through malolactic is 
almost entirely in stainless steel. So we have a lot of stainless steel in this wine that's gonna drive more of that acidity um, in addition to not going through malolactic because there is that oxygen transfer when you have it in an oak barrel. So I always say that this is like the entry level Chardonnay to get people like that say, I don't drink Chardonnay. I'm like, well, let's try this one mm -hmm. because it's got some oak. You definitely can taste oak, but it's not overly oaky to the point that makes people say like, oh no, no, I'm not, I'm not ready for this. But then as people start to drink more Chardonnay, I find that their, their palate opens up to trying Chardonnays that have a little bit more of that oak influence. So it allows you to kind of broaden their mind as you enter the Chardonnay atmosphere. Um, but I, I definitely think that this wine is trying to be approachable. You know, our three winemaking principles are, um, we want it to be varietal, varietal typical. We want it to taste like Chardonnay. Uh, we want it to have elegance and balance. We want to make sure that, you know, you're not reeling from acidity and you're not reeling from oak. We want you to be very feeling very comfortable throughout the experience. Um, and we want it to have a sense of place. So we want it to taste like Livermore Valley. And I think that the, the apple and the citrus that you're getting in there is definitely some trademarks of that diurnal swing that the morning fog in the mornings mm -hmm. um, references. And then, I mean, as we move into Kristen's wine in Arroyo Seco, I would call that the all day fog. <laughs> right. <laughs> At times doesn't dissipate till like 2 p.m. <laughs> Whereas it's always gone by 9 a.m. in Livermore, which is just kind of a trademark of our valley. Well, and so Nikki, one of the questions that's coming from William too, um, he was noticing that um, this particular bottling from Wente has moved to screw cap. Could you just briefly comment on that choice? Yeah. So. I think the choice was made that this is a ready to drink wine. It's not necessarily a wine that we'd want you to, to lay down forever. I mean, you certainly could, and I'm sure it's lovely after, you know, five, 10 years, but this is a wine that we want you guys to be able to go to the grocery store, come home and open it up for dinner that, that evening. Um, so I think the screw cap makes that really easy. And um, for me, I, it's one of my favorite things that we've done. At first I was very resistant. And then I've come to love it because it's just so easy and um, it, it makes my life a lot, it makes the challenge of picking which wine I wanna drink that much simpler. Cause I'm like, oh, this one's easy to open. I can close it and then have it again tomorrow. Don't have to worry about losing the cork and my husband throwing it away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it was really just going for, again, that approachable style. We wanna be, we want this wine to, to be comfortable for everyone. Well, and there's a, there's a unique, um aspect to this wine that a lot of people might not realize in terms of the varietal makeup. Do you mind commenting on that? Yes. Um, so generally we do about 2% Govert's demeanor in this wine as well. Um, and at first we only did that in a, a different Chardonnay and then we just started to love it so much. And it's kind of now our like winemaking trademark that we might add a little bit of Govert's demeanor into our Chardonnays just to kind of round out the floral expression um, and give a little bit of body and structure to the wine that might not have been there without it. Um, and it's so interesting. I'll do winemaking tastings with our winemaking team and they'll do like a half, a half a percent of Gewurz, 1% of Gewurz and then 2%. And you can taste the difference. Uh, as soon as you can taste the difference, that's where you're like, okay, no, stop. We don't want to change the flavor. We want it to taste like Chardonnay, but that nice structure and that really beautiful aroma that we just added makes it perfect. Um, so it's, it's a fun process to try and make it a little bit different and put your own unique stamp on it. Well, Gewürztraminer is so great for like fleshy mid palate, but I could just mm -hmm. imagine it sort of filling that in a little bit, but the, there's also this really subtle spice component. That's clearly not Oak spice, but it's just sort of this natural kind of, um, warm spice. That's really pleasing that I imagine comes from the Gewürztraminer as well. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's great. Um, so I know Evo and, um, and Kristen, you each have this wine as well. This is like, it's a very different intention behind this wine than the first three that we looked at, but do either of you want to comment on things that are standing out to you here? Sure. This, uh, explains, uh, uh my perception, uh, when I smell this wine immediately, I got a whiff of lychee, which uh -huh. is associated with the mm -hmm. Now I understand. So I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, Imagining it, uh, beautiful aromatics. Uh, congratulations, uh, Nikki. Uh, very uh, elegant wine, uh, easy to drink. Uh, I got lots of sapidity. It's very soft, supple. Uh, goes down, and you want more. So well, well, well made wine. Thank you. 
Yeah, I really like also, uh, again, that, that aromatics are, are just fantastic. A little bit of honeysuckle, you know, bright floral, um, and just the, the little bit of subtle spice and, and the texture is just beautiful. Yeah, very nicely balanced. That's great. Well, and so we'll, um, we'll keep talking about this area, but um, I, I'd love to go back to that Central Coast map. Um, Nikki made the comment that there's occasional fog in Livermore and persistent fog um, as you go down into Monterey <laughs> County. And so here with this map, you can again see that, you know, Livermore is not marked on this map, but it's that real upper right-hand part of the Central Coast AVA to the east of San Francisco Bay. But I like showing this map too, because as we, um, as you can again, see how incredibly long the Central Coast is, but really importantly, Monterey AVA is, is marked here. And I wanna make, be sure to emphasize that Monterey AVA is not Monterey County. Um, you could bottle as Monterey County because that's considered a political appellation, but, um, but the actual um, climate appellation, Monterey AVA, it's, it's an incredible, demarcates that incredibly long, narrow valley. And really importantly, like we talked about last time, notice that the northernmost part of the Monterey AVA is actually open facing Monterey Bay. And we won't talk about it too long this time because we did address it last time, but there's an incredibly deep canyon underwater there in, in Monterey Bay. And the reason that that matters is because, again, that cold ocean influence coming down from the north sort of builds up in pools there in Monterey and creates a real cold air pocket over the water there, which then informs the weather all the way down the entire length of Monterey Bay. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that Monterey AVA actually has quite a few nested AVAs within Monterey AVA. And um, we're gonna focus in um, uh, next week with the, with the Pino um, discussion, we will talk more about Santa Lucia Highlands, but, but today what we're gonna focus on is one of the nested AVAs of Monterey, which is the Arroyo Seco AVA. And so um, Kristen, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about Arroyo Seco as a groin area. Sure, sure. Well, uh, one thing that, it, that you mentioned actually is, is that you, as you look at the north, uh, that, that huge font that is the Monterey Bay, average temperatures there are about 50 degrees in, in Monterey Bay, as we were talking about fog uh, well into the day. Uh, what's nice about being this basically close enough to Monterey Bay is we get that cool, cooling fog influence, um, but, but warm enough uh, as, we're, as we're further south in the in the valley to be able to get right um, and similar to I think what you were talking about before with another valley uh, this the the Salinas Valley actually does get warmer toward the south end of the valley and then the hot air rises and also similarly pulls in the wind uh, from from Monterey Bay and that's probably one of the most unique features of Arroyo Seco as a grape growing region is that during the the grape growing season between 1 and 7 p.m. Uh, each day, uh, the fog burns off and then we get that wind. And the wind is about 20 miles an hour, which effectively shuts down the vines uh, between one and seven in terms of grape growing each day. And it extends our growing season about three weeks in the season. So most of our Chardonnay is really looking like uh, October is, is a big month for us. And trying to wrap up in that first week of September, it's, it's, it's rather compact that way. Um, but we see higher acidities for that, for, for for the wind and then also greater textures for that too. So mm -hmm. it's a very unique grape growing region. Um, also for the Arroyo Seco River that comes from the Santa Lucia range, the Arroyo Seco kind of uh, headwaters are in the Santa Lucia range for the river and uh, comes down through the Arroyo Seco Appalachian. And it's known for these cobblestones that uh, again, we have gravelly sandy loam primarily, which is really good for draining. But if you get down deep, we have these cobblestones that really also provide better texture and uh, provide better balance for the vines between uh, leaf and fruit growth. So well, it's you, between the wind and the rocks, uh, grape growing region. Well, and one of the things that people might not realize too is that, um, I mean, so Arroyo Seco is unique in that you have that morning fog, which of course is mm -hmm. diffusing the sunlight, which means the sun is not getting direct access to the vines. And that's common in each of the regions that we're looking at today, actually. But mm -hmm. With Arroyo Seco, and then in the afternoon, you have incredibly powerful winds. It's basically impossible to afternoon barbecue. It's too windy. And um, the reason that that matters is because, you know, 
you only have this very short uh, kind of ripening window of the course of the day, not till after the fog burns off and up till the wind starts because, and the, and that combination does a lot to retain natural acidity because um, when winds get above eight miles per hour of the leaf will actually start to close and the, the breathing apparatus or stomata inside the leaf will actually start to close in order to avoid dehydration. The effect of that is that the vine does not breathe off its its natural acidity, so to speak. And so windy areas like Arroyo Seco, actually um, the natural acidity stays high um, later into the season, but it also, um, this combination of fog and wind actually makes for a longer growing season. So you pick later, as you mentioned. But also I'd like to point out that you mentioned earlier, this is um, Clone 76. And so this is the first wine that is not Wente influence. <laughs> we wanted to have a wine too that had, that showed a, um, uh, this sort of other sort of selection. And so in this case, it's a Dijon selection, which as you mentioned earlier, but again, we have a different sort of intention with this wine. This is actually the, of the lineup. This wine was aged longer than the others. My recollection, mm -hmm. Kristen, it's about 14 months. Do you want to um, briefly describe the kind of stylistic intention of this wine? Sure, sure. Uh, so as you mentioned, Clone 76, um, this is all hand harvested and brought into Brought, in, brought into the winery, um, you know, in, in the early morning to retain the fresh fruit flavors. And uh, then actually it's 100% uh, barrel fermentation, like all the Chardonnays at J. Lower. It's 100% barrel fermentation. Uh, we do use a couple of different yeasts. I know we've talked a little bit about yeast. Uh, for this wine, we use uh, CY 3079, which gives us that nice bready uh, kind of yeasty aroma. It kind of adds to that as well. Um, and Kind of complements the clone 76 which by nature is really more apple pear meyer lemon uh kind of brighter fruits so we kind of add, kind of build in layers with that uh and then we do batonage uh weekly and then top every three weeks throughout the throughout the whole aging process we do go entirely through from uh, malolactic fermentation on this is gives us that nice creamy texture uh and it's all french oak aged for this wine this is one of our, our vineyard series wines mm -hmm. uh so again trying to looking for that really nice complement of of vanilla and, and mocha and cocoa kind of well, and yeah. so um j Lore actually makes three different styles of chardonnay and as you said this is from the vineyard series you have a regional series as well and um i you know in order to kind of address the question that came up earlier too. Nikki, you actually farm not only in Livermore, but down into um, parts of Monterey AVA as well. And so could you comment briefly on the sorts of yields that you're seeing from Chardonnay in the Central Coast? Yeah, um, so we have vineyards that produce everything from a half ton per acre, um, which is not a sustainable result, uh, all the way up to probably eight or nine tons per acre on some of our lower priced bottled wines. Um, but, you know, we, we see kind of the yields all over the place and then make the decision on quality from our, our winemaking standpoint after harvest um, in both Livermore and Arroyo Seco. Livermore, I'd say our yields are probably a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. um, that's where our half ton breaker comes from. <laughs> well, and I, um, one of the things to point out too, is like the kind of the, in, the intention of volume can really play into some of these different choices for yield. And then also, um, you know, Evo was talking about yeast, um, um, using natural yeast earlier, but if you're on, um, sometimes on higher volume wines, it just makes better sense economically to go ahead and introduce yeast in order to sure, ensure that the volume really does go all the way through. And the, um, one of the things that I like to remind all of us is that wine is a business and, and there are ways that we can ensure that we're able to focus on sustainability by having wines that deliver economically. And so that combination finding, it depends on the business model, it depends on the ownership model um, and, and kind of the overall long-term goals, but, but remembering that if we keep the economic um, viability going, we can then increase the kind of environmental and human aspects of sustainability on the other side as well. And so there's always a, a kind of a dance and balance there depending on your region and your business model. But, um, so let's go ahead and look at the, at the central coast map and we'll um, talk about the 
about the sixth why, and then we'll and then we'll look at some of the kind of bigger picture questions that have been coming in as well. So again, we're back here on the um, central coast, and um, you can see now we've gone all the way to the south. Uh, next week with Pino, we really will get all the way south and talk about Santa Rita Hills as well. But here we're going to um, stop at Edna Valley, which we touched on briefly last time. But Celeste, if you could just circle Edna Valley there. Notice it's a tiny, tiny little AVA nested within the giant Central Coast Appalachian. And one of the things that's important about Edna Valley is that very much like how Kristen was describing Monterey with that like um, that long air kind of air chute where you know, as the inland part heats up, it pulls air off the ocean that, that creates a wind effect. Edna Valley operates in a kind of milder version of a similar phenomenon. So Edna Valley is much, much smaller, but one side of it is again, open to the ocean. And so as the inland part, um, heat, the temperatures heat up, it pulls air in from the ocean. And so Edna Valley is actually one of the, one of the longest, coolest growing seasons in North America. It has very extended ripening. Um, tons of fog in the morning because it ha does have that opening to the ocean and then also um, plenty of, uh, of afternoon breezes, at least. Um, I, I, I would argue that the winds are much stronger in Monterey than in Edna Valley, but that, that moving air influence is still very much there. So if we could go ahead and look at the, um, at the wine slide, then we can um, go ahead and uh, talk about this wine as well. So the, um, the Edna Valley, um, actually Chardon, it's, it's a unique appellation in that Chardonnay really is its flagship variety. Chardonnay, of course, is the most planted variety in the world, as well as in California. But it's even so, it's rare to have um, growing regions that are that really hang their hat only on Chardonnay. And Edna Valley certainly grows um, Pinot Noir and does quite well with it. And the, the slightly warmer inland parts actually do well with um, both Grenache and Syrah as well. But, but um, Edna Valley really treats Chardonnay as its, as its flagship. And there were lots of vines planted in the 1800s, but it's uh, as if the region went through a pause and then kind of took off again in um, the start of the 1980s. And Edna Valley Vineyards in particular um, was established in 1980. And Nikki, you actually worked there for, for a time. So could you tell us a little bit more about the region and, and this winery, things for us to keep in mind about it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the, the soils in Edna Valley are, are highly volcanic and there's some oceanic areas as well, but you're going to get some some heavier clay density, darker soils, volcanic red red clay soils in some parts. Um, and it is again very, very cool climate. You know, uh, there's parts that are so cold that you don't know that you're going to get it right. I, I remember I studied at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and they had some Cabernet vines planted in Edna Valley uh, area that they had us try just because it was a bad idea to grow it there <laughs> because it just tasted <laughs> vegetal. And it, that's the best way to learn is by actually doing something like that. It's like, wow, no, this wouldn't grow well here. Um, and that's kind of Edna Valley in, in essence is just very cold, cool climate that you're going to get some some beautiful fruit flavors, but from the right varietals like Chardonnay and Pinot, and then you need to move pretty far inland in Edna Valley to get those um, Syrahs to taste the way you'd like them to taste as well. Yeah, really, in some of the more protected pockets that that where the wind is reduced and a little bit warmer. Right. Yeah, and so um, so yeah, uh, just to clarify, Edna Valley is in the San Luis Obispo AVA or um, county, which is uh, one county north of Santa Barbara County. So just to give you a feel for for um, for that area. So Edna Valley also it's unique in that it's halfway between LA and San Francisco. So it's a it's an interesting place to visit because it it's a little quieter in some ways but then it's not too far from San Luis Obispo which is a college town and because it's so close to the ocean people um, from both LA and San Francisco like to drive in and take a visit but it does actually take several hours to get there. This particular vineyard is only a few um, kilometers from the ocean it's about probably seven kilometers from the ocean so really very much ocean influenced and um, the uh, 2019 vintage was relative had a relatively cool and wet uh, winter and spring, and then went into a really long, slow growing season. It was a little cooler, as Evo mentioned earlier. And so um, this is the current release. And this is, again, um, this particular wine that from Edna Valley, they, again, make multiple styles of Chardonnay, but this is their regional expression. And so while the vineyard and most of the vines for this particular wine are from Edna Valley, 
This is appellated as Central Coast because the idea, again, is to make a very approachable, very friendly, um, and a very affordable um, kind of entry level style wine. And so that's the um, intention for this particular wine. Again, our goal in picking these six wines was to give a full range of, of kind of styles and price points and regions from California. And, and so we got a, a really nice range and just six tidy little wines. One of the things that we didn't do though, I, I um, was uh, trying to manage time, but I actually wanna go backwards just for a minute and take a moment. I know um, Nikki and Evo, you both have the, the J-Lore as well. And so if you'll forgive me for going backwards, I'd love to actually take a little more time to, to go ahead and taste that wine together. Um, we heard some of the intention behind it. And again, it has a little bit more um, time in, in barrel for aging here. And um, um, Kristen described um, some of the some of the practices chosen in cellar, but also again, interestingly from the vineyard, it's entirely clone 76. And so Evo, I'd love to hear some of your impressions as you taste this particular wine. Thank you. I have a 2017 in my glass. Looking at the color, it suggests a, a riper uh, riper grapes. Uh, nose uh, is dominated by ginger. I, I love ginger, so I found lots of ginger here, which is very refreshing. Um, then on the palate, um, it's uh, all about, uh, I would say, baked uh, pear or poached pear. So it's also very, very aromatic. Uh, there's influence of oak, uh, lots of nice oak lactones here. Uh, it's a bit richer uh, style of wine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the heavier style of wine than uh, some. And I would like to say uh, you will hardly find bad wines in California. You might disagree about styles. It's all about different styles, but uh, uh, it's so competitive. You can't be in business uh, by making bad wines. So as a consumer, you are just going to taste through many different wines and pick style that you like. So very lovely wine. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Nikki, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of pear on the nose and palate for me, which I really love. Um, and after you said ginger, I was like, huh, I actually think I can get a little ginger as well. That's mm -hmm. nice. Um, I really like that as well. Um, I think there's a really good mouthfeel. Uh, the structure is nice and, and big, I think, uh, and has a, a really nice acid at the end that kind of pulls it all together, wraps it all up. And I, I again, I also think this is a beautiful wine. Um, and I do also agree that it's pretty hard to come by a bad wine in California. And every wine that I've had of Jaylor's is also wonderful. So you're not going wrong if you shop with them. <laughs> the big thing I think to... Um to remember is like we all of course we all have our preferences with wine and and it's really important for us as wine professionals to practice recognizing what's a preference and what's quality you know and and um and i i take it that's part of the point that evo and nikki are both making that there's there's a really lovely quality and again at different price points and four different intentions across each of these wines but then uh you know and so we can recognize that and also recognize you know, what our various preferences are at the same time. It's interesting too, to go back to the Arroyo uh, or to the Jaylor and then, um, and then to taste the Edna Valley at the end, because it does really bring out that, um, that point that you were making Nikki about how incredibly cold um, Edna Valley is that there's a, just a little more, you know, you get that, you know, as Evo is describing, there's just a little more, well, there's intentional mouthfeel in the, in the, Arroyo Vista, the Jailor um, wine, and and then again, mm -hmm. partially through that, ex, you know, more comparatively more extended aging, and then you get this kind of very crisp green, cold, like almost cold feeling um, Chardonnay in the in the last wine, and so it's it's fun and interesting to see the contrast. One of the questions that came in though too is just in terms of thinking about, you know, we spent a lot of time at the beginning talking about different styles of farming and regenerative farming. And um, all three of you are very focused on farming practices, but, but I know there are challenges that come up with um, kind of pushing aside um, chemical options as well. And, and you know, in fog laden areas, mildew, um, which could of course go all the way to rot in some places would be one of the biggest risks. Um, are there other, other sort of you know, one of the other things I think that's come out recently too is as we've gotten new sort of insect issues around the world, 
um, which as Nikki was mentioning early on, can be a vector for viruses that go into the vines. Some, there are some um, insects that actually there's no organic way to, to treat at, at this point. And so that's another example of an issue. Is there anything that any of the three of you would care to admit can be another vulnerability when you're focused on uh, more sustainable farming practices, something that becomes a challenge at that point? Yeah, Elena, if I may uh, yes, apologize please. for jumping in, I'm very passionate about this. In the 1930s, there was a very smart uh, agronomist by name of William Albrecht, uh, American. And he said, the pests are nature's garbage collectors. <laughs> pests are nature's garbage collectors. And all diseases are nature's cleanup crew. So this is natural order uh, that, that this disease is destroying weak. And uh, those weakest plants uh, in terms of nutrient, nutritional, deficiencies are attacked first. So uh, I wish we can organize this uh, again in three years and I can report uh, we just started our regenerative farming three years ago. I strongly believe that through proper nutrition that if uh, uh, every grapevine gets proper nutrition it can be resistant uh, to all these diseases. Uh, we already after two years of uh, regenerative farming in our Charonet we had to being organic spray up to 15 times a year we are down to only four or five. So we, we cut the uh, uh, spring. Yes, uh, last year, 2020 was fairly easy for mildew. I have to uh, mm -hmm. explain. Still, it's very encouraging. So I believe that all these so-called diseases uh, can be uh, handled by proper nutrition, just like us. If you eat proper food and have proper uh, uh, microbiome in our gut, uh, we are far more uh, immune uh, to diseases than uh, uh, if we don't have proper nutrition. Well, thank you. Yeah, so it's an interesting, um, again, that, that shift in far farming focus to the question of biology rather than just chemistry, it um, can really shift your perspective on how different, different pests or diseases are functioning in a vineyard as well. I know some producers that even, even with leaf roll, they feel is, has helped to um, change their picking times. And so anything in excess obviously is a problem, um, but I've spoken with lots of winemakers around the world who will do things like, um, they'll say, actually, no, we intentionally planted close to the forest because that helps, um, helps us balance the um, kind of wildlife and overall biome and um, kind of insect complexity in a vineyard as well. So when, when you start to really drill into details with farming, you can see even in the insect um, diversity in your vineyard can actually be a benefit around some of these issues as well. Um, uh, Paul, I think from Quebec is saying that there is an article on UV light treatment of mildew in New York state. And uh, he's wondering if there's any um, interesting work that any of you are aware of with um, using kind of newer, less conventional um, practices to deal with issues like mildew. Um, there's, there's a whole range of things I could list off, but I'd love to hear, um, um, you know, Kristen, perhaps are there any kind of newer emerging um, kind of, I think we're in an interesting moment in wine growing in that we can choose to farm organically and then celebrate technology that can make that combination easier, um, which I think some people are perhaps less aware of. Are there any kind of unique sort of new practices that you're seeing come out there in, in the area of California that you're in? Yeah, I think uh, one thing you're talking about is, is again, getting precision viticulture in place. Mm -hmm. And I think it speaks back to what Nikki was talking about a little bit, which is just really making sure that we have models and can really um, only if we have to use something, only use it when it's absolutely necessary. And I think mm -hmm. that's true for us at, at J Lower, uh, both from a pest management perspective and certainly from an irrigation perspective as well. And I think that's that's very important to keep an eye on on both things and, and, and the environment to minimize the inputs that we have at this point. We'll yeah, that's great. Healthier vines, yeah. Yeah, so just that point that um, kind of being more present can, can mean you input less, it mm -hmm. sounds like. Nikki, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, we've done trials with uh, companies that do different methods of um, treating mildew. One was agrothermal, that it's like almost like a heat lamp, essentially, that goes across your vineyard. 
Um, I, I mean, we're always interested in try, trying different things. That, and I think there's, the, there's endless possibilities as more smart people get behind the wine industry and keep putting really great ideas in, into it. Um, starting with models and, and, you know, learning more about how we can anticipate the future, um, but then also working on automation and, you know, how can one person be doing more things at once um, to kind of set us up properly, I think is another good way to, to set us up for success and help with, you know, if we can be running three tractors by one operator, uh, in a vineyard, you open up your canopy so much faster if you're able to, you know, mechanically leaf uh, with those three automated tractors. I said, you know, so things like that, that can improve a lot of different things, especially around mildew if you get more airflow in your canopies. So, Well, and in California, for the first time uh, in the history of the world, we, there's actually a new fully electric, fully automated tractor that's that's just come out that people are starting to experiment with too, that can really um, do some of that work that you're talking about too. That's the hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're still getting to know how it works. So I hope that everyone enjoyed the panel today. We obviously spent a lot of time talking about farming and how it um, ha plays different roles, depending on growing conditions in different uh, regions of California, got into a little bit of the history of Chardonnay in the state as well. Next week, we're going to shift and really um, look a lot more at, um, at winemaking as well, specifically for Pinot, of course. And we're going to talk about um, other regions of California, again, really coastally focused, uh, but, but different regions than we were able to get into this time. So hopefully um, all of you have found some great takeaways and learned a little bit more about how farming can influence quality and, and kind of intersect with intention in order to create this style of a wine. So thanks so much for having us and really enormous thanks to Nikki, Kristen, and Evo for giving us your time and sharing your thoughts on, on all of the wines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Thank you, Evo, Nikki, and Kristen for an amazing perspective today on California Chardonnay. We hope all of you enjoyed it uh, as much as we did and found it as worthwhile as we did as well. So please join us next week, Tuesday, April 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the next session with Elaine as we explore California Pinot Noir, as she says. Elaine will be joined by winemakers from Brewer Clifton, Davis Bynum, Walt, and Clara. So please register at calwine.ca. As well as Han. As well as, as Han, exactly. Yes, as well as Han, yep. yeah. As well as Han, thank you for that. And yeah. register at calwine.ca, California Wine Month. Thank you, everyone, and hope to see you next week with some California Pinot Noir in your glasses. Have Big a good thanks afternoon, to Celeste, everyone. too, for managing the screen sharing and slides. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thanks, challenging Celeste. job. She's great at it. <laughs> She sure is. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.